Well, our guest is Steve Leader, author of More Beautiful Than Before, How Suffering Transforms Us. Now, Steve, I want to thank you for joining us. What uh, an important message that uh, you bring in that book. Thank you, Andy. I'm happy to be here with you today. Uh, Steve, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and your background and, and uh, what you do, and then uh, let's let's uh, hear a little bit more about uh, your book and some of the thoughts there. All right. Uh, well, I grew up in the Midwest in Minnesota. Um, I got a degree in writing from Northwestern University and then uh, moved to Israel and began my studies to become a rabbi. And uh, ultimately became ordained in 1987. So I've been a rabbi now for more than 30 years and my entire career has been spent at this really amazing, amazing congregation in the heart of Los Angeles called Wilshire Boulevard Temple. It's actually the oldest uh, synagogue in Southern California founded in 1862. So I'm, I'm very fortunate to serve such a remarkable community. Uh, the book really was born out of my own pain. Um, about three and a half years ago, after 27 years of being a rabbi and counseling people through incredibly painful situations, you know, I, I had seen it all in 27 years, um, you know, murdered children, the death of the babies, you know, I, I helped parents lower a casket in the ground the size of a shoebox, um, you know, cancer, uh, destroyed public re reputations, divorce, you name it, I'd seen it. And I tried my best to help people through it all and thought I was doing a pretty good job. And then you're the first person that, that people come to in most cases. In in many cases, I am. I, I call the couch in my office the couch of tears. <laughs> so and and you know, quoting the Psalms. So it it's it's a lot of pain when you deal with a community of ten thousand people like I do. Yeah, that, uh, that, that is uh, something that uh, you're really never prepared for, are you? Well, yes and no. If you have the ability to, you know, learn from experience and, and be a sensitive listener, that takes you a long way. But I certainly was not prepared for it in the deepest sense, and this leads to the book. So what happened was, after 27 years of all of that, thinking I was doing a pretty good job, to make a long story short, I was in a very frightening car accident that ultimately resulted in injury to my spine, uh, opioids, steroids, depression, surgery, opioids, steroids, depression, and it really, really rocked my world. A real cycle, isn't it? Yes, and it, it this kind of physical pain was something that really brought me to my knees. It was torture. And for any of your listeners who have suffered nerve pain, they, they have a sense of what I'm talking about. And I realized, kind of coming out the other end of this experience, that despite my best intentions for 27 years to help other people with their pain, I actually knew virtually nothing about pain. It was only when I suffered myself, the kind of pain that really just left me curled up on the floor begging for morphine, that I began to understand pain and its and the essence of pain and the ways in which it can open us. And this, this is why I wrote the book. I sorry to interrupt, but I just uh, yeah. had a question about pain uh, yes. because so much of the time when we think about uh, or talk about pain, uh, I don't know, uh, oftentimes anyway, uh, we think about emotional pain, but uh, the, the emotional pain goes in your case and the people I, you help with, with the physical pain as well. Well, they're first cousins of most emotional and physical pain. And interestingly enough, when researching for the book, one of the things I discovered was that emotional pain and physical pain affect the very same region of the brain. Hmm, now, the difference is, however, that physical pain cannot be refelt once it has passed. You know, you stub your toe in the middle of the night, it hurts for a couple minutes, and then it's over, and you really can't refeel that pain. Emotional pain, on the other hand, has a much longer shelf life, and you can revisit that pain and refeel that pain uh, in some people's cases for the rest of their lives. The question is really not, Andy, whether or not we feel pain. The question is really whether or not we make something meaningful of the pain that we suffer. That's why the book is called uh, More Beautiful Than Before, 
how suffering transforms us because my perspective on all this, which sounds paradoxical and yet is so true, is that in a very deep and important way, we're actually more whole only after being broken. Wow, that's and quite a, a, that's a big statement. Well, and I think it's true that there's a wholeness that comes only as the result of brokenness. Yeah, uh, and uh, I guess you don't have to hopefully get to the degree of uh, some of the pain that you described, but uh, hopefully you can reach that uh, other ways, maybe not. Well, I think the pain, look, people have different thresholds for pain. And I think in a way, a high threshold for pain is, is not such a blessing because it can cause you to ignore your emotional well-being or your physical well-being um, for most of your life. And uh, look, none of us who are boomers appreciate the decline of our bodies. On the other hand, it certainly gets our attention and ideally motivates us to take better care of ourselves for many of us for the first time in our lives. And that's just a small example of how pain in some ways can, can be your friend and bring you a more meaningful future. Uh, so, you know, it, it, look, let me be clear about something at this point. In no way is this book an idealization of pain or a glorification of pain. Pain is terrible. It hurts. Uh, it's not worth the lessons we learn. Nevertheless, neither is pain worth less. There is something to be gained. Although, again, you know, uh, it's not worth it. But we don't get to choose whether these painful things happen to us. We only get to choose whether we're going to use them to change our lives. The, the sages of the Talmud said, if you are visited by pain, examine your life. Pain is an invitation to change your life. Well, that uh, is an important uh, phrase to remember. I, I think I, I broke your train of thought. You were talking about the car accident, the uh, the medications and, and what you were going through and how that transformed you. I, I don't know if you wanted to continue that. Train well, of thought. It, let me just say that it certainly made me a better human being, a better rabbi, a better husband, a better father and a better friend. Uh, I wasn't a bad guy before, but I'm definitely uh, a better listener. I'm a more empathetic person. You know, uh, let me be um, a religious figure for a moment and share this insight with you from from the Bible. There's a verse in the Bible, in the book of Deuteronomy, that says God places God's words upon our hearts. And the sages ask, why upon our hearts? Why not in our hearts? Certainly, if God could place words upon our hearts, God could place words within our hearts. And the answer the sages give is that God places God's words upon our hearts. And it isn't until our heart is broken that the words can enter. So there's a kind of openness, a kind of empathy, a kind of caring and love that we can achieve only through surviving our own suffering. Uh, and it, it, it equips us to be there for others who are suffering. Now, uh, and, uh, go yeah, ahead. I was going to say uh, something that you talk about uh, in your book uh, is how some of us who may not be as trained as you can help others in pain. Um, what might be some takeaways on that? Right. OK, well, the first thing I think is what you should not say. You know, when you're dealing with someone who's suffering, what you don't say is as important, maybe more important than what you do say. So I always advise people when someone they know and care about is suffering or even a stranger uh, that that somehow crosses your path but particularly people who are part of our inner circle, never say these seven words. Never say, let me know if you need anything. That is such false empathy. It's like kabuki empathy. What it does, even if it's sincere, is it nevertheless places the burden back on the shoulders of the person who is already suffering to tell you what he or she needs. And they don't need homework. They don't need more to worry about. And by the way, most people, when they say, let me know if you need anything, are really hoping that the person won't. So do not ask that question. Simply ask yourself this. What if I were in his or her situation would be helpful? And then do it. Don't ask, do it. 
drop that meal off at the front door, arrange carpool for the kids, arrange play dates for the kids, uh, send the massage therapist to the house, send the card, send the email, uh, you know, offer to take care of the lawn, offer to do whatever comes to your mind that would be helpful to you. I assure you that same thing will be helpful to that person. So, you know, anticipate their needs and act. That, that is probably the most important thing I can share. The other thing I will tell you is this. I often get phone calls that go something like this. Steve, my best friend from college who lives, you know, on the other side of the country has just been diagnosed with cancer and they've given him three to six months to live. I'm going to visit him. What should I say? I don't know what to say. And my answer there is don't worry about what to say. Just show up. Just walk in that door. Your mere presence says everything that needs to be said. First of all, there really is nothing to say, right? Right. At some level, there is nothing to say. You're, you need to walk in that door and the rest will unfold. You will know what to say. Don't worry about it. Just show up. You know, the, uh, the Navajo have a beautiful tribal custom when there's a death in the village. The mourning custom is that you go to the home of the mourners, you walk in the door, you sit down, you stay a while, then you stand up and you leave. You say nothing, you, you just are there. And that presence, that presence, as I say in the book, changes nothing, but means everything. You know, and I think what you said is a great reassurance to people who uh, don't know what to say and knowing that that's adequate is, uh, is, is good, good, a good message. I'm the same way. Listen, after 30 years of being a rabbi, I stand outside the, the hospital room door before I walk in that room and I don't know what I'm gonna say. I just know that it's my responsibility as a caring human being to walk in that door. I don't know in advance what I'm gonna say. Just show up. Yeah. And those are things that I'm sure covered in the book. And I don't want to get off uh, target, but I do j just want to pick up on something you mentioned that we hear so much about these days is uh, is, is uh, pain and, and uh, uh, pain relievers and, and oh, the addiction yes. and all yes, that. Yes, um, yes, yes. I don't know if you can touch upon that, but... Uh, I can. Yeah. Let me tell you this. Uh, one of the most powerful things that has happened, which I did not anticipate about this book, was the, the degree to which it would speak to people who, who suffer from some form of addiction, including this opioid epidemic in our country. You know, our country represents 5% of the world's population and we consume 85% of the world's pain medication. So, you know, there are a lot of people struggling with this addiction. And the truth is, this is the thing I think many doctors don't wanna be open about, the truth is that there are there are physical conditions for which opioids are the only thing that helps. Nothing else will work. And, and that's just a sad reality of certain forms of chronic pain. But this is a real challenge. I certainly, certainly um, was taking far too many of them. And it was not an easy thing for me to stop. And it did cause uh, depression and uh, withdrawal and and it was a very difficult thing for me and i've been open about it because i want people to say to themselves well my goodness if it can happen to rabbi leader it can happen to anyone which is exactly right it can happen to anyone mm -hmm. uh, so you know this it, this is a very important point and i'm glad you raised it yeah well uh it's a great message uh and uh, and you provided some uh, some thoughts any other takeaways that uh well the other thing andy i think that might interest your your listeners about the book is that the book deals with another type of pain which uh i did not see much about when i researched books in this genre and that is not so much what do we do when we are the sufferer but what do we do when we are the cause of suffering mm -hmm. what do we do when we are the betrayer not the betrayer then what and there's an awful lot in the book to help people understand how reconciliation can work understand the power of saying i was wrong understand how these mistakes can ultimately lead to a deeper friendship a deeper marriage a deeper kind of intimacy uh, within our family and our friendships so i think you know 
At some point, not only will all of us suffer pain, but at some point, all of us will inflict pain upon another. That's the, to be, to suffer is to be human and to be human is to suffer. So, uh, you know, for those of us who have dysfunction in our families and dysfunction in our friendships and dysfunction in our places of business, uh, I think that part of the book will be extremely helpful. Well, that can almost, uh, in this uh, day where we're getting so much uh, news about what's related to that, it could be a, a book in itself. Well, yes, there, there's a, a fair amount devoted to it in, in More Beautiful Than Before, and I really, uh, I really think it helps people. That's great. Now, uh, uh, Steve Leader, where can, uh, where can people get hold of your book? Uh, well, people can get the book on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, uh, and also, if they want to learn more about the book and, and, and me, they can go to steveleader.com, S-T-E-V-E-L-E-D-E-R.com. And we've done our best there to really have a lot of resources for people who may be suffering some form of pain or another. Well, and I deeply appreciate this opportunity, Andy. Thank well, you. We, we appreciate it, too. Thank you so much. Our guest, Steve Leader, author of More Beautiful Than Before, How Suffering Transforms Us. Steve, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Andy.